since the 14th of September 2022. So may we all try to develop uh, sati, this quality of recollection, and to do this a lot. Because mindfulness, it's very important. And the more mindful we are, the closer we are to the Buddha. So we try to make that mindfulness um, really kind of firm with the mind, really together with the mind. So whatever we're doing, and if we're speaking like this, then we do so with mindfulness and have a sense of caution there as well, and this helps to protect the mind. So this recollection, it's um, possible for us to recollect many things, many different things, Uh, but that recollection may be wrong recollection, as mitya sati. So when we talk about Sati is mindfulness or recollection. What we mean is Samma Sati is right mindfulness, right recollection. So if we recollect a memory from the past, something that's very deeply um, there within our heart, something that we don't like, but we're not able to fix that thing because it's gone already. And some action that we or someone else has done or some speech and something that we have cognized before, maybe a mistake that we've made. So we can recollect that, and that can become the cause for the mind to become gloomy and sad. Or there can be this proliferation and fear, recollecting the future. This can create the mind, or make the mind become stirred up and agitated, scattered, anxious. So what we need to do, rather than recollecting the past or the future, is to recollect this present moment, have our mindfulness in this moment. Mindfulness over the body, over the feelings, the mind, the Dhamma. And these four bases for mindfulness are very important. So with regards to the practice, when I studied with Lumpu Cha, he didn't talk about many different kinds of things. You'd say, have mindfulness, have effort, keep your precepts well, be one who gives, who has respect, who reduces their conceit. And if we train like this consistently, then the mind will become peaceful. So he taught us to observe our bodies and minds as well. Because what is it that we're deluded in? We're deluded by this body and this mind. This heart which is conditioned by ignorance and by delusion. And what we're deluded in is the five khandas, these five aggregates. So in my first year as a monk, um, I had many doubts. And there was a question I had about these aggregates of the body, the feelings, perception, mental formations, and sense consciousness. But that concern was just pariyati. It was just a theoretical concern. So I went to ask Venerable Ajahn Chah this question, but he wouldn't answer me because it was just that, it was just theory. But really, what it comes down to is just having mindfulness. We put down our theoretical knowledge first. And if we can make our mindfulness consistent, then samadhi becomes firm, and this will develop into wisdom. So there are things as well which can obstruct our hearts. And these things are very important too. And there are also external obstructions as well. So like how things are developed these days. In previous times, 
um, the houses that people would build were just uh, one story and they were very simple, made from natural materials. And if any changes occurred in the environment, uh, like fires came up or there were floods or earthquakes, then these buildings would easily break. But on the other hand, it was very easy and quick to build them again because they didn't require a lot of things, didn't have a lot of things. But now the world has become more and more developed. The possessions that we have become more and more. We've got electricity and then we have electrical appliances in our houses too. And the buildings that we construct are higher and higher. But if something happens, if there's an earthquake and they break, um, then they can be very difficult to build again. Like how the world is becoming more and more developed, we're creating more and more things, and there's more happiness that people are finding in that development. And the number of people in the world is increasing. The number of buildings that we're constructing, these houses or high-rise buildings, are becoming more and more. And then, initially, we didn't have roads, but then we build roads. And these can keep us kind of dry and make our traveling very easy. But one day they can become obstructions themselves. So if there's flooding that happens, then this can create a lot of difficulty. So this is external development. In terms of the heart, there are also obstructions in the heart. There's flooding that happens in our hearts as well. So the flood of sensual desire, and this too is a flood. And there's the flood of ill will. And then there's the scatteredness of mind. And this inner annoyance, aggravation, drowsiness and doubt, these can flood the heart. These two are things which obstruct our minds from reaching peace, from meeting with peace. And all these things that we delight in, this is what takes us to birth and death, cycling in samsara again and again, just like this delight in sensuality. So if we have virtue, sila, then we become a human. If we have goodness, we become a deva or an angel. If we don't have sila, then we fall to a realm lower than the human. And if we attach to many things, then there will be a lot of worry there. And then when we die, that's very dangerous for our minds. So we need to practice and have mindfulness. Our mindfulness needs to be centered in the body and in the heart. So whenever we're moving, then we're mindful. And we keep that mindfulness collected and see the state of justness, of simply being so. So whatever sense impressions arise within the mind, we see that that's merely a sense impression. But now, the state that we're in, we don't see that. What we see, however, is the mind and the sense impressions all mixed up, and we're not able to separate them out. So we take it all to be me and mine. But if our mindfulness is well established, then we can contemplate to see how it's merely a sense impression that arises within the heart. And in truth, that sense impression is not me. This knowledge arises, but that knowledge too is simply knowledge. We contemplate the heart and see that the mind 
is just the mind. And we don't attach to anything at all. And right here is the arising of the highest wisdom. This is Dhamma. We let go. And if we can experience this for just a flash, then we meet with emptiness. And here we know, we know how to reach Marga and Pala, the paths and the fruitions. So this question can arise, well what is the way to Marga and Pala? And these are the kinds of doubts of a practitioner that they want to know first. And I myself was like this, I wanted to know, what are these things like? So I doubted. So whether we doubt or we don't doubt, just put it all down first, and practice first. Put our effort into walking meditation, sitting meditation, having mindfulness a lot, developing this constantly, having effort there. And so we try to keep up this effort, seeing the dangers and the drawbacks in the cycle of samsara that can go on for such a long time. So if we haven't yet seen the Dhamma to the first level, then that's a dangerous state to be in. And it's possible to fall down into the lower realms, the realms of woe. And so there can be a lot of fear over that. And we have can be we can suffer due to our attachments. And even if we attach to good things, to goodness, that too is a cause for suffering. If we're afraid of evil, afraid of bad karma, and then that too be a cause for suffering, due to the wrong views that we have. But when we have mindfulness there, then the mind and its object separate out. You see that those objects are merely objects. They're not a being, an individual, a me or a you. A form is just form. And form here means the body, this kaya, this body. That when the four elements come together, they make up this body. And we see that it's merely so. We call it a body. And it's just that. It's just body. There's Vedana, feelings, uh, the mind, the Dhamma. And so this mind, uh, jitta, that in Pali we call it the word jitta in Thai. It's a different word in English, in Swedish, in Dutch, in Chinese. It's a different word. But really it's just a knowing element. And in fact, all things are Dhamma. The awakened beings who have attained to the Dhamma, and if someone comes to them and scolds them, verbally abuses them, then they see that as just Dhamma and they can laugh. Whether they're afraid, fear is Dhamma, lack of fear is Dhamma. And they see all things are Dhamma. And that there was one a great teacher who had a nun come and ask him for money and he wouldn't give her any because he said that monks don't have money. So in response, she shouted at him, verbally abused him and he just laughed and said, no, oh, that's right, that's correct. And he wasn't angry because he could see that it was just ignorance there that was conditioning her mind. So he had kindness towards her and felt sorry for her. And this is what it's like when people have the Dhamma. So may all of you put your efforts into practicing so that your minds can have the Dhamma as well. And when they have Dhamma like this, then there'll be energy to the mind. It'll have this pala, this energy, this energy of mindfulness, of effort, of samadhi, of wisdom. And it begins with faith, and this faith is something that's very important. So today there was a 
lay woman who came to the monastery because it was her birthday. And she said that she would come to the monastery three times a year. And she came from Maptaput and there was flooding um, on the way here. And so she drove her car and normally it would take 40 minutes, uh, but today it took her two hours and 45 minutes to get here. We see that she had this great energy and faith. Because she wanted to develop her life, this life that she had now. She had faith in creating merit and being generous. And for all of us here, we have faith in the practice. So it's something that we need to try to do as well, because we see the benefits in developing mindfulness. So we should try and cultivate that and make that quality grow and grow. Having mindfulness here in the present moment. The mindfulness that we have now, we have mindfulness, but it's lacking, it's not enough. We have samadhi, but that's not enough, <clears throat> what we have. The wisdom that we have, that's a wisdom that's come to us through our studies. But this is a wisdom that's tied up with self, that's concerned with me and mine. So we need to try to develop a wisdom that can see into not-self, a wisdom that's able to close off the lower realms. So we should try to do this, bring up our effort in this. Seeing that, kind of bringing up this mindfulness that can prevent the mind from getting involved in liking or disliking, that this is the path to seeing the Dhamma. And this is a teaching that Ajahn Chah would emphasize and reiterate. So for myself, that before I had seen the state of the Dharma, and this was very clear, and seen that all the material things in this world kind of break apart, and there was no kind of self to them, and seen that all life must end in death, all the physical things here just arise and cease and break apart. And so you have to see this before kind of we break apart, before our lives break apart, to see that nature of breaking in its truth. So there was mindfulness, there was mindfulness and wisdom there. And when that mindfulness and wisdom is there, then when these things break, we don't suffer over that. But these days, people don't contemplate this. They get material things and they see them as being lovely and nice and beautiful. But when those things change, then their hearts suffer. So we need to contemplate these things with wisdom. And Ajahn Chah, he taught very straight and he said, it's right here. And when we have mindfulness and samadhi well established, the body and the mind become very bright. Then it's like the mind is going to leave Sangsara. And there's great confidence here in this point. As the energy, the effort in the mind revolves around and around. And the body and the mind feel very light and cool. And so it's possible to reach this point. When samadhi gathers together, the doubts that we have reduce and get less and less. And then the samadhi it comes to one point, and there's great peace there. The mindfulness is firm, samadhi is firm, and in the state it develops into wisdom. The wisdom that is sharp enough to defeat ignorance and can pass over all its obstacles. These obstacles that obstruct us, these five hindrances, when the mind gets through them, then it reaches peace. 
But in order to get through them, we need to put up a fight. Because we don't get there by just sitting around, by just lying around. But we need to train our minds and really put up a good struggle to not retreat, but forbear. So sometimes we feel a bit lazy, but we need to practice all the same. When we are feeling energetic, then we practice just the same. So these days, the world is in quite an agitated state, and there are many different disasters that are occurring. But the real disasters are those of old age, sickness and death. And Ajahn Chah gave a simile, or he said that even though there may be flooding, don't let that flood your heart. And having a heart flooded means the defilement. It means greed, hatred and delusion are overrunning the heart. And this is very dangerous. So we need to have effort in practice. When our mindfulness is strong and firm, then the mind will be able to separate out from its objects. The mind can separate out from the body and become empty. And there's great confidence there and no doubts. And we see that it's here. This is exactly where it is, because we've seen it for ourselves already. So we could say it's like there are 360 ropes that are binding our hearts. And when we cut one of them, then we feel like a great sense of, of ease and of freedom. And then here, when we've released ourselves from that one strand, and we see that our oh, Nibbana is like this, because we're beginning to meet with Nibbana, touch Nibbana. But we're not yet able to go over altogether. And there can be doubts as to why that's the case. But this is how it is when the mind is about to change over and there's this knowledge of that. We can ask ourselves, well, why don't we just see everything? Why isn't this full already? But it requires our time. However, we know the path to get there. And so we carry on cultivating this, cultivating our mindfulness, cultivating our samadhi, bring these qualities up again, until our effort becomes automatic. And when we are skilled at the practice, it becomes automatic. Just like when we become skilled at writing, then wherever we go, we're able to just write automatically. Or if we become skilled at reading, we can just read. Or if we study a language like Thai or English until we're skilled at it, then that just comes out naturally. So when we contemplate well, and samadhi comes together, then effort will be automatic, and we won't become fed up with the practice, because we have the bojangas, the factors for awakening of piti, of joy, and pasadi, this, um, tranquility, which are nourishing the heart. So there's effort that there, that's there, that's filling up the heart. And the heart becomes empty and there's a great happiness to it. And the uh, sense impressions that would drag us into liking or disliking just aren't there. There's great joy. There's nothing which is binding a heart, which is squeezing on the heart. So like if we see a form and hate arises, then that puts a squeeze on the heart. But we don't have that anymore. And so we carry on practicing each day. Each day we're able, at this point, to 
abandon some of the kilesas, able to cut one of these ropes that bind us each day. And then in six months, there's knowledge there that grows within the heart to the point where we don't have any doubts because we've seen clearly. And when we destroy this first barrier, what's left is not difficult. And this is how the awakened teachers have put it, that it's not hard, or so hard anymore. There's no eighth life left. You see that the mind is just the mind. We're able to abandon ignorance, craving and clinging, and the mind becomes pure. When we recite Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, we see that the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha are one and the same thing. So for myself, I was quite foolish. I was staying with an arahant, and I thought that the Buddha was one thing, the Dhamma was something else, the Sangha was something else. And that these, there were these different minds there, and so I was quite foolish in this way. But in reality, it's just the one thing. The Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, it's one thing. And that if we have thoughts that separate them out, then that's wrong view. So may all of you set your hearts well on this path of practice. <laughs>